Steve Keller, welcome to the podcast. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm really happy to be here. Thanks for asking me. Yes, yes. This is super, super cool. Um, to kind of give a bit of background, um, as I, I typically kind of do with these, uh, these introductions, I came across you and your work on Twitter. I right. first saw your, uh, your TEDx yes. on audio branding. So I was blown away. So I think we should start there and kind of give some background as to what you do and uh, see where this thing goes. Sure. Uh, we'll just uh, keep it footloose and fancy free. <laughs> I like uh, that. Yeah. And I'll give you just a little bit of my uh, sonic journey, if you will, because I yeah. always like having that context when I'm, you know, chatting with other folks, uh, you know, where they've come from and how they got there. Uh, so just to give you uh, a, a little bit of background, um, there are uh, three big passions uh, mm -hmm. that I had in, in life as far as my interests in my career. Uh, so one of those is psychology. Um, mm -hmm. That's actually what I studied uh, at university, graduated with a degree in psychology. I was always fascinated by human behavior, um, how we perceive the world and interact with it and with each other. Uh, and so my, my plan was to uh, head into grad school, get my graduate degree or get my degree, go on to, to, uh, to grad school and, and either have a practice uh, or work in some field uh, that was related to social psychology. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, I pointed the ship in that direction uh, got finished with uh, school, was sitting out for a year, uh, had a couple of jobs, one doing research and statistics uh, in a community mental health organization, and then the other was teaching uh, kids with severe behavioral disorders. Wow. But uh, while I was doing that in preparation for grad school, uh, I was also still participating in the other passion in my life, uh -huh. which was music. Yep. Uh, so ever since I was a kid, uh, I had always loved uh, music. Uh, I took piano lessons when I was a, a, a young lad of about uh -huh. <laughs> you know, yep, six, yep. six years old. Uh, yeah. And then uh, had a cousin that played the guitar. So I taught myself how to play the guitar. Uh, started um, uh, writing songs in high school, uh, mostly because it was a fairly effective dating tool. Uh, <laughs> but that was, you know, that was the only other thing behind it. Uh, but I'd never considered it as a career. So here I am doing these two jobs, getting ready to go to grad school, and just playing in some coffee houses and, and writing situations mm -hmm. uh, in the meantime. And there was never really an aha moment for me. I think what happened was I just gave myself permission to consider yeah. something a little different uh, and thought, hmm, maybe I could do something with this uh, music thing. Uh, and so uh, instead of heading to grad school, I veered off in another direction, and that detour ultimately led me to Nashville. Mm. Uh, so I was uh, working in Nashville, um, had a number of uh, different opportunities to work in the music business there. Uh, my big break, believe it or not, was doing dance remixes of country songs. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> So, so that's so cool. Yeah, yeah. So for dance clubs, uh, you know, there's this phenomenon that started happening um, in the early '90s, where these clubs people were coming in, they were doing all these line dances, DJs were starting to play uh, the the cuts that were serviced them from the label, but they didn't really always work well. Mm -hmm. And I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. I was a guy that knew how to strip a vocal off of a master and uh, do a dance mix around it. And so I was one of two guys in Nashville <laughs> that made a career for a few years out of doing these remixes. Oh, uh, that's so cool. So, and that led to some other things, uh, including, uh, you know, working on albums uh, and also composing music um, for advertising. Mm -hmm. And I found through that process that I actually just loved marketing and advertising. Yeah. Uh, so I had a knack for writing copy um, and started doing some freelance uh, copywriting for some agencies as well as the music. And um, so between that uh, advertising work and then some work doing A&R for an independent label, uh, working with some publishing companies, artist management, um, those, uh, those worlds of advertising and marketing and psychology and research and music and entertainment all collided in 2005 hmm. 
Uh, and that's when um, I stepped into the, the role of owning my own company, um, IV. Uh, and it was uh, a company that I took a look at the marketplace and I thought, there's got to be something else I could do with this skill set. And I'd been reading uh, about this thing called audio branding. Oh, uh, yeah. And most of the really interesting work was coming out of Europe um, mm -hmm. at the time. And so uh, I decided maybe that's where I needed to kind of focus my attention. And uh, it was uh, a combination of all of my passions. And uh, eventually things took off uh, in Europe. I opened an office uh, there with a business partner. And um, we uh, started doing a lot of branding work for global brands that were based in that market um, and eventually brought that learning back to the, the U.S. and uh, had uh, a really great run. The company eventually um, became more and more of a consultancy. Mm -hmm. uh, and ultimately, I started uh, working on a sonic identity for another company named Pandora. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> and it was... <laughs> It was through that um, engagement and the fact that I had kind of been working with Pandora, meeting a lot of the folks at Pandora mm -hmm. for about a year and a half in, in a few other um, related uh, pieces of work. And finally, uh, we just kind of looked deeply into each other's eyes and realized <laughs> it was a match made in heaven. And it was meant we to be. We wanted to put a ring on it. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so Pandora hired me, um, and as a result of that, I've been, uh, you know, closing down my own company, uh, mm. basically at Pandora, doing everything that I did at IV, but um, mm -hmm. doing it on steroids uh, with a much larger team. And my official um, uh, title here is Sonic Strategy Director. Oh, that's so, so cool. So. That's a long and, and sorted story, but it hmm. does kind of give you a background and help you understand um, all the different dots through my life that have really connected and brought me to this particular place. Yeah, I I love that. I mean, I uh, one, I just love kind of getting that, uh, that story from the start, especially when you mentioned that you had this passion for music and psychology, but you took a little bit of a chance and said, you know what? Let's see where this thing with music can go. And I, I just, I think it's been a bit of a common theme on this podcast where people will, because there's no straight path in music. You know, I mean, right. music is there. It's you got to kind of forge it yourself in in whatever whatever direction that might be. And I just love seeing that that you had this passion behind it, and then that's really created this such such an interesting path and and man what what a what a cool position to be in now where you're able to have this influence at you know such a a, a household name of pandora and and have this uh ability to really do something that you have this deep passion i just think it's i think it's so so cool yeah i think you know i think it's it's really amazing when you've lived long enough to be able to kind of look back and look at these series of transformations that occur in your life because, you know, the, the title of your podcast is Chasing Creativity. Oh. And, you know, if if I would reframe that, I would say <laughs> I would I would say it's chasing chaos. Oh, yeah. Uh, because the the creative process um, is a process that is inherently chaotic. Mm -hmm. And and by chaos, I don't necessarily mean, you know, a messy desk or a messy studio. Uh, you know, by chaos, I mean these moments where things that have always worked one way aren't working that that same way yeah. for, for whatever yeah. reason. And and chaos forces us to to look at the dots that are connected because sometimes they're disconnected. You know, it was it was Picasso who said that, you know, uh, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but that, uh, you know, every act of creation actually begins with an act of destruction. Yeah, uh, this idea yeah, yeah. that that something's torn apart, something's not working the same way, and the temptation is always to try and rebuild it the way mm -hmm. we've we know. But mm -hmm. but creativity is that thing that kind of forces us into a new direction to reevaluate how we're connecting the dots, and in the process of of connecting and disconnecting and reconnecting, something new is born out of it. And that's right. my, you know, that's the story of my life. That's the story of the lives of, of 
all, all of my friends and, and colleagues and, and uh, fellow travelers on this journey uh, share is this yeah. idea that there are these transformative moments that uh, for most of us, we could have never planned it that way. Right. Right, right, and and I and I love that having a little bit of that optimism where you can kind of step into an unfamiliar path or step into something that there's no straightforward path there, and and you and and the outcome to get to that kind of chaos, uh, chaotic state as you mentioned, you have to take something that's a little bit off the beaten path. You have to look at things in a kind of a different uh, uh, from a different perspective, and that's what I think leads to these such. Uh, I don't know, interesting paths and interesting stories and interesting careers. I mean, that's where that's where the fun is. Yeah. And I think what what that process has taught me is, you know, when we enter those periods of chaos, uh, it, it there's a lot of fear around mm. it, you know, and as many transformations as I've had in my life and know enough to know now that I can trust the process, entering those moments of chaos is no less scary and no yeah. less fearful. But I think what we learn is that, you know, we don't have to respond to that fear by either fighting it, you know, mm -hmm. pushing against it and saying, OK, I'm not going to change. Um, uh, and uh, neither do we have to, you know, run away from it. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I think what I've learned is sometimes we just need to take a deep breath and give chaos a little room yep. to do what it's going to do. And we we see the path on the other side of it. So uh, anyway, that's enough of philosophy. Well, that, <laughs> no, no, that's, I, that's hey, for another podcast. No, no, this this podcast has become as much talking about music and creativity, uh, j just as much that piece as the path behind it, and it always ends up being that it's this it's this uh, uh, philosophy as you mentioned, where you kind of have to step into the unknown a bit and just see what the heck happens and. In my experience so far, taking those little, I mean, little steps to something unknown makes for the most fulfilling rewards. If something comes out of it and you just get a little feedback from someone, oh, that's really cool. That makes all the difference, you know, yeah. for, for me. And I, I think that that's, uh, that's echoed a lot, um, you know, with yourself and, and other guests. So um, I just love that. I, I just, I think that's so, so cool. Um, but but yeah, so you, you've you had just, and, and kind of touching into what I, what I, drew from the uh, the conversation on TEDx or your, your talk on TEDx that you kind of tuned into something that I think a lot of people aren't tuning into right away. When you're talking about this influence of audio associated with a brand or that example when uh, they changed the music when people were buying wine, I, maybe I'll let you right. jump in and kind of speak to that. You kind of saw something that maybe a lot of people didn't even realize was happening. Yeah. You know, I think um, I'm I'm this weird combination uh, of, you know, there's there's part of me that's an academic, hmm. uh, and then there's another part of me that's kind of drawn to, um, you know, performance and that kind of kind of creativity, um, where you have to move away sometimes from the the rigor, if you hmm. will, of 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 the science. Uh, and I refer to myself uh, very often as an audio alchemist. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and and that's that's. Purely in a in the Jungian sense of of alchemy, where it's this uh, the again these transformative moments um, that occur because of the combination of things, and for me, an audio alchemist is is someone who really kind of bridges um, this spectrum uh, be between you know the science of sound, mm -hmm. if you will, um, and sound art, mm -hmm. uh, and. Uh, and I don't see those as, uh, you know, two opposite ends of a pole. Uh, I really see them as just two sides of, of the same coin. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, f for me, the, the interesting arc of my career um, has kind of pulled me back into to academics. And, and as you referenced the, the TED Talk, one of the things that that I f was finding more and more interesting was, uh, you know, understanding the psychology around um, the way that music and sound has an impact on shaping our perception and our yeah. behavior. So in that TED Talk, there are a series of examples um, that I give around that um, and how we might apply 
science and research and, and measurement to understanding that behavior and that perception. Uh, and that if we understand it well enough, we might come close to be able to, you know, hacking our perception and behavior with sound, if you will. So the, yeah, yeah. So the, the, the piece of research that you mentioned was um, from a couple of, uh, of researchers, uh, Hargraves and, and North, uh, who've done a lot of interesting work um, uh, at this intersection of social psychology, um, emotions, behavior, um, music, and sound. And mm-hmm. so they, they did an experiment where the, the lab, if you will, was um, you know, a liquor store. Uh, and uh, there were wines set up on the shelf. There were French wines. There were German wines. People would come in. They would select which wine they uh, were going to buy that evening. They would go through the checkout. And as they were getting ready to leave, a researcher would stop them and ask them, you know, tell me about the wine that you chose. Why did you choose that? And there were all kinds of different uh uh, reasons, you know, that people gave. It was maybe they liked the shape of the bottle. Maybe they liked the, the label. Um, maybe they were drawn to the name of the wine. Um, but the researcher would uh, also ask them if they happened to notice the music that was playing in the background. And uh, while some people were aware, uh, a very small percentage said that it had any impact, any impact at all on their behavior. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what was happening in the background was that uh, on some days they would play uh, French-sounding music, and on other days they would play uh, German Schlager or, or uh, <laughs> you know, Oompa yeah. music uh, in the background. And uh, what they found was that the days that the French music were playing, um, I believe it was 77% of the wines sold were French. And oh, on yeah. the days when the German wines were playing, I think it was 72% of the wines sold were, uh, were German. So the only thing that was changing was the music in the background and a significant impact on the buying behavior. Right. And I think that's just one example of how music really can affect our behavior, our choices, our perception of things without us even really understanding or realizing it. Yeah, yeah, that's that's such the such an interesting piece of the whole thing cuz so many people as you mentioned in that that uh that that uh example didn't understand or or was it weren't they weren't tuned into the fact that this music was playing in the background. So it's subconscious. It's working on this weird subconscious level and um and I just I think it's fascinating. It came it comes into play too with the the um, audio branding these mnemonics associated with companies. Like you started when you first started that TED talk, it was the Intel, you know, da da da, right? And and yeah. everyone knows that that, and they immediately think Intel. And it's it's just it's something that for myself, you hear when when you think when you take a step back and you think about it. There are these audio mnemonics or these branding audio uh, audio brands associated with so many different products, and you just don't think about it. You don't realize, right? Um, sometimes you don't, uh, and sometimes you do. <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> in, yeah. In the case of a mnemonic, or a, we sometimes call them audio logos or sonic logos, or people have tried to mash the words together into a mogo or a uh-huh. sogo um, uh, or an earcon. Um, they're uh, they're really memory devices uh, that are established as much through repeti- repetition as anything. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's a simple paired association. Mm-hmm. So the more often that you hear it and hear it in association with a brand, you just begin to make that that pairing. Um, uh, it's it's very similar to a visual logo. You know, yeah. mo- most brands have uh, clearly defined brand marks um, and brand color, and they're very consistent in the application because they know if you see it consistently in a number of different uh, use cases, uh, right. you'll start remembering it. It's the same way with an audio logo. So an audio logo is to your ear what a sonic logo is to your eye. And uh, the the more that pairing happens, you know, with Intel, the bum 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 bum, yeah, yeah. Know, or T Mobile, ba da 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 da, or even <laughs> Netflix, ba bum. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, you 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 build this association, yeah. And then eventually, you don't need to see the the logo with it. You can just hear it, and you know, you you'll even have a mental 
mental picture of it if, if you're successful. So that recall is really important. And there's even science around, uh, you know, how you might think of creating mm-hmm. those things. Uh, you know, we've, we've found that uh, five to six notes is usually the sweet spot. Um, mm-hmm. Anything less than that, uh, it's easily confused. Um, obviously, there's always exceptions to the rule. So you have bomb, 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 the NBC, oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Three, three tones. Um, and uh, if you start getting into seven notes or more, um, it's a, a little complicated. Yeah. So it becomes obviously a little more difficult to, uh, to remember. And so when you stop and think about the really iconic audio logos, most of them you will realize that Intel, bum, 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 yep. T-Mobile, ba-da-da-da-da, McDonald's, ba 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 I mean, sorry, yeah. that was Coca-Cola. Or the ba da ba 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 That's right, right, right. McDonald's. Five, five notes. These are all five notes. And, um, you know, some of those may have been uh, intentional, thinking about that. Some of it may have just been natural because that uh, kind of tends to be the, the best place to develop a hook mm-hmm. uh, or to remember something. Uh, so there's ways where if you know some of these principles as a composer or a designer you can bake that into your composition Hmm. and you know kind of improve your your statistical average if you will right um for for how sticky it is or how much of an earworm uh, yeah right find yourself humming it later (laughs) yeah yeah yes now it seems like just by thinking about those uh the 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 ones you mentioned that they all seem to kind of have a kind of scale aspect to them and almost like a very uplifting major major chord association right yes. not you know you're not getting lots of minor distinct right. <laughs> chords coming through so so that must be part of it I'm guessing too is that just some social kind of uh, uh, influence that we associate hey you know a major scale uplifting that's positive is, is does that come into play certainly you know so there's all kinds of um, you know music science around uh, particularly around emotions mm-hmm. um, so you know if we're gonna we we often you know talk in terms of um, uh, mood and mood congruency uh, there's there's a term core affect uh, which was developed by um, uh, a researcher by the name of Russell. Uh, mm-hmm. And and Russell kind of took a look at um, the arousal of something. Was it high arousal or low arousal? Uh, and how that um, was uh, factored into a matrix uh, against uh, something called valence, which is, you know, in, in some ways, are we drawn to something uh, or, or are we pushed away from it? Is it mm-hmm. pleasant or unpleasant? And depending on where you fall in that matrix, uh, you know, something that's uh, high arousal and um, high valence or, or highly, you know, you're, you're attracted to it. Um, those are the tends, tend to be the things that, you know, we really love and it could be excitement. Um, drop the arousal down and you get into, you know, a little bit more of serenity. Mm-hmm. Uh, then if you start pushing the valence uh factor on that access, uh, access back towards uh, something that maybe isn't as pleasant, uh, low arousal and unpleasantness, you'll tend to move towards depression or, or sadness. Mm. Um, high arousal and unpleasantness, and you're getting into anger uh, and, and frustration. Mm. Um, so by knowing where the emotions fall on that axis. There's been research that's been done around tempo, uh, modality in terms of something major or minor, uh, harmonic uh, complexities of things. We're, we're already starting to say, well, here's the mark we want to hit. So what are the musical building blocks in terms of tempo, timbre, uh, rhythm, harmony, modality that move us in that direction? So yeah. already we're starting to think about ways that we could craft something uh, and craft a, a melody. So to your point, uh, you know, you, you will tend not to hear um, uh, audio logos that are, are minor. Um, yeah, yeah. Most of them will tend to be uh, a little faster. Uh, and part of that is because you want it to be uplifting, uh, maybe even a little uh, 
exciting, definitely pleasant. Uh, another part of it is you don't want your mnemonic to be, you know, too much longer than four or five seconds mm -hmm. um, uh, because you don't have a lot of space. You don't want it to take up a lot of real estate in, a, right, in an right. advertisement. Um, so there's that factor to think about. And the other thing uh, is using a melody. Melodies are easier for us to remember. Mm -hmm. So if you walk away from something and you hum it, uh, that tends to stick a little bit better than if it's just sound design. Uh, you know, we may remember a sounds, but that's also a little less flexible. Mm -hmm. So if you have a McDonald's, uh, the, uh, you know, the ba da ba 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 yeah, yeah. If, if you travel and you go to other countries, you may hear that, you know, executed in a lot of different ways, a lot of different kinds of, of instrumentation or styles. Uh. But the moment you hear those notes, doesn't matter what kind of instrument is, is performing it. The right. moment you hear those notes you know that's McDonald's. Now, if that was just sound design, it's a lot harder to be flexible with sound design because once you start changing that sound design, you've actually changed the whole shape of, of the logo. So right. Net, Netflix, for instance, um, you know, there's a piece of sound design that's, that's part of that that's, that's based on... Um, you know, House of Cards, um, when Frank Underwood would tap two times uh, with his ring oh. on the desk. So that that was kind of the the semiotics, if you will, the symbolism that was underneath it. But mm -hmm. they built a tonality around it. So they could maybe change that tonality a little bit. You know, they could lighten it up or change some of the instrumentation under it. And as long as you get that ba ba piece yeah, yeah. with it, uh, you'd recognize it as, as Netflix. So there's, there's lots of tricks of the trade, um, around that. Yeah. It's, it's so cool. And, and I mean, one thing that comes to mind is, is how advertising is changing. I, I I'm imagining, or I imagine that this is something that you're very, uh, tuned into and thinking about quite often as you kind of move into this space, working with Pandora, because, you know, a lot of people now are getting their news from different outlets. They're not as much watching typical television. They're watching Netflix or they're on Instagram or Snapchat, where now you get these like tiny clips right. for advertisements, you know? So, so it, it must kind of be a very interesting time to be thinking, okay, there's these new platforms that are, are presenting media. And those are of course going to change again over three, five, 10 years, you know? So, so being in this space where it is also fluid must be very interesting too. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, I think one of the interesting things for me right now is, you know, for years, um, those of us who've kind of practiced uh, audio branding as a, as a discipline. Mm -hmm. uh, so really thinking about it, um, as more of a strategy than just the tactical execution. You know, we've been saying for quite a while, uh, you know, what happens if you ever move into a world where there's not visuals, where mm. people can't see these visual marks, or there's no text, so people can't read the name of the brand? How is your brand going to stand out? And what's happened in, in just the last two years is we've, we've entered this, um, as, as I call it, this age of audio disruption, mm -hmm. where now with smart speakers, with voice interactivity, ah. we're now interacting in a world where search isn't about text. Search yeah. isn't about visuals. The responses that you're getting back are sonic responses. Oh, that's so cool. So in that world where you don't see the brand and you're not even texting with the yeah. brand or reading something in response, right? how is a brand going to stand out in that world? You yeah. Know? And that to me is what's really exciting because now we're, you know, it, you're thinking about retail. You know, mm -hmm. what, what happens when it's not visual packaging for your product, right. it's, you know, uh, an audio packaging when it's a sonic shelf as opposed to a physical shelf in retail. Um, yeah. it, it, it now really reframes the conversation. And finally, you know, after, you know, some of us have been talking about this for 10, 15, 20 years, <laughs> um, there's this, this huge conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so that's the, that's the, the really great thing, uh, about 
the age we're in right now is that it's driving more cons- uh, more conversations around sound. Right, um, right. But as with everything, uh, you know, there's there's always a blessing and a curse. Uh, and the curse is while it's elevated the conversations uh, about sound uh, and audio branding, we tend to be creatures of habit. Mm. Uh, and so when we talk about audio branding, brands and their agencies very often go immediately to the execution. Oh, an audio logo or a mm. brand theme or a jingle or maybe a brand voice or maybe even thinking about the sonification, um, you know, navigation sounds, functional sounds uh, in an app. Um, they immediately jump to execution and they work the same way they've always worked, which is, mm-hmm. oh, I need to hire a composer or I need uh, to yeah, hire, yeah. A, hire a sound designer. Let's jump right into creating something yep. and we'll you know, do a series of demos and then we'll sit around a table and decide which one we like and that's the one we're, we're, we're going to use. Right. Um, instead of sa- taking a step back and saying, no, we need to think about this strategically. Maybe we need to apply a similar methodology that we applied when we were creating our visual identity, Mm -hmm. which was really about design Mm -hmm. um, and thinking about the symbols, um, Mm -hmm. the semiotics behind the brand, the brand values, the brand emotions, the brand meaning, and how do we develop a sonic language that communicates those things in the same way that we've developed a visual language to communicate them. Uh, And when you do that, then the the process becomes very, very different uh, because a creative brief gets informed by a lot of uh, of other inf- information uh, and composers really are designers and demos are prototypes and you're going through different iterations and then we can look at how we can test those things um, in market and how that testing process gives us feedback into the prototypes, how we can look at an entire audio ecosystem um, and kind of develop this sonic DNA so that Mm. audio branding isn't just the assets. It's not just the audio logo, but it's how is the brand communicating its identity and an an entire sonic system. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it it makes sense, right? Because if there's so much... And emphasis put into the design of every other component for the branding, it can't just be, oh, let's bring in a composer with no no strategy behind it, no research. I mean, it, it's it's it it doesn't make sense. I mean, it makes it. I think that a person might think that a a such a powerful correlation like the McDonald's one. I mean, everyone knows that one. Like, da, 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 da. You know, they might think, oh, that's easy, just bring in a composer, but it's not. I mean, there there's there's much more behind it, as as you mentioned. Which, uh, yeah, it just it just makes it it makes it so interesting, and it would just I would imagine just be such a a fascinating world to be working in. And when you were bringing that up earlier, when the one uh, the one example I wasn't even really thinking of is is the idea of now you're right we're interacting in our home with with smart speakers, right? So you right. might just be saying, "Hey Alexa, turn on this or whatever," or you know if you have your streaming service on and maybe you're in your car, you have your headphones on. When ads come up, I'm not looking at the ad. I'll hear right audibly what's going on, you know. So the the ability for a company to uh, inject their you know audio mnemonic there, their audio brand at that right as that advertisement comes in, you might catch someone versus if it was just talking and no one's no one's watching the, the ad anyways, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah, and it's really, as I said, it's really kind of building a, you know, a sonic identity around an experience. Yeah. Um, so those assets are really important. And, you know, not all brands need an audio logo, but uh, it's, a, it's a place where a lot of brands think to start or, mm-hmm. you know, a brand theme. Um, and certainly... You know, composers can come up with five notes. Right. And, you know, there are some, uh, you know, sonic identities that exist and work because, uh, you know, brands have uh, hammered the the sonic logo uh, into our, our ears. Mm. Uh, but I think if we're talking about a return on audio investment mm-hmm. um, and we really look at... Uh, you know, a much broader scope uh, in terms of how hard we can make these assets work for brands. Uh, I think 
the difference um, is really having a strategy behind it so mm -hmm. that you're not just ending up with an asset at the end of the day that you're throwing onto the end of your communication, but you're thinking about how do I tie this into a consumer experience? Um, right. You know, across all the touch points for a brand, whatever they are. It could be in a television commercial, it could be in a, a streaming ad on Pandora, but it could also be in uh, the the user interface uh, on an app. It could be the music that's playing in, in the background in, uh, in a restaurant. Mm -hmm. um, it could be the sound that the product itself makes. Um, and in that world, now we're starting to get into some of the areas that really fascinate me about perception and behavior, mm. um, you know, f particularly uh, work I've done in cross-modalism, um, where uh, we're kind of looking at the way our senses all work together. Uh, and I've been fortunate enough to spend time uh, with Charles Spence, who's the head of the Cross-Modal Research Laboratory in Oxford. And Charles and I have uh, become friends as well as uh, research collaborators. But, you know, Charles has spent his life looking at the way um, our senses uh, are connected. Mm -hmm. And one of the work pieces of work that he's done that's been really fascinating to me is sound and taste. Uh, and so, you know, we've found through our research that we can actually influence um, the flavor of something oh, wow. uh, by what we're putting in your ears as well as what we're putting in your mouth. Uh, oh, you know, we can, so we can play with sweetness and bitterness and saltiness and spiciness. Uh, and it, when you begin to understand that kind of power in sound, mm -hmm. then you start realizing, oh, that music that a restaurant's playing in the background, they yeah. may not realize it, but it could actually be having an impact on not just what you order, but how it tastes. I, I was going to say that because I was thinking the beer. Okay, so if I go out on a Friday night with my girlfriend, right? We've gotten through the work week. We go to a sports bar. I swear the beer, the beer tastes better there than if I'm just having a beer at home on a yeah. Tuesday. And it's the it's the ambience, it's the music playing, it's all these different sounds, it's all these different, uh, you know, uh, senses that you're picking up on. And I, you know, I, it's so funny because as you mentioned that, that's the one I I went to is is like when you're at that restaurant, things taste. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, Charles uses the uh, the example, which you know, I I think this is really clever because we've all had this experience. But you know, he talks about. Uh, you know, you've 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 gone on holiday. He's from England, so holidays, you know, could be uh -huh. the south south of France. It's a little closer. <laughs> so you know, you're in the in the south of France, and and you know, you're near the the beach, and you you know order that bottle of rosé, and you pop the top, and it's just the most delicious thing that you've ever tasted. So you you get a whole case. You take it back home to your friends, and right. you know you 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 invite them to dinner, and you say, I can't wait for you guys to taste this. This is the best you know, rosé that you're ever going to have. And yep. then you pour it in the glass and you taste it and you're like, that's not as good as I remember. <laughs> you know, because, yeah, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. you know, France isn't there to go along right. with, with the rosé. And that's the way, you know, that's the way experiences work for us. And mm -hmm. so there's this whole power of sound beyond just how we use it in advertising and marketing mm -hmm. um, that that has a whole other layer of, of perhaps meaning and and purpose and when i think uh particularly of of healthcare and healthcare brands and and um the potential for sound uh in a healthcare environment you know we were just mm -hmm. talking about taste what if you're a diabetic patient and right. we've got to cut sweets out well what if we could give you a soundtrack that might put some of that sweetness back in yeah um, yeah yeah you know or or alarm fatigue you know, what are some sonic interventions, if you will, uh, into alarms where perhaps we could help caregivers still get the information they need, but we can reduce the anxiety uh, of patients and their, their families. Mm -hmm. Ways that sound has been shown to, um, you know, improve uh, outcomes in terms of uh, uh people uh, who, um, you know, in, in their perioperative uh, care um, or uh, people in, in chronic treatment and how we may can use music and sound to increase patient satisfaction. Um, and that actually improves health 
um, from from a research perspective. So oh, yeah. you know, there's so many rabbit holes that that we can go down here. Where and you know, mm-hmm. we just we started with an audio <laughs> logo, right, you know, right? And right. now we've kind of moved into the ways that that sound can still have a brand association, mm-hmm. but could really impact the lives of a brand's consumers or, or target audience uh, in really positive or negative ways, mm-hmm. depending on whether or not they're thinking about it. Yeah, it's just, it's it's funny what, as you, I, I just think this is, that is so fascinating to me. And it, it's it's something I hadn't thought a lot about. And it's just the first thing that comes to my mind is thinking about like this, uh, this influence of the location having, having this, uh, this effect on on perception. I mean, it makes sense, but but then you think about for music producers who are, are a lot of them are listening to this podcast. You know, the people that get to have their music played at a, a live event. You know, they have a leg up now, even if it's not some you know another DJ will play right. their song. Now someone's going to leave that event and be like, oh, this DJ is the best, is the best. So, you know, you know, and then everyone who's just at home doing their own you know bedroom producing, they're still kind of trying to get started out. Right. All these different things. You know, it's it's. Uh, they have they have a step they have to make you know it, it's it's funny to think about those things and it's just it's this awesome world of uh of uh something that i personally had not looked into it's not something i would think about very often it's like you hear the audio logo and you just take it for what it is you're like oh yeah that that's cool you know and, and it, it sticks in your mind but you don't realize the the true influence of sound associated with a brand or just in these other examples as you mentioned too how these the way you can change certain things can can really have a, an impact on a brand or someone's life. I mean, when when we're talking about like the healthcare industry, it's really, right. it's really really fascinating. I mean, it's it's so 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 one thing. I mean, there's a couple things I wanna I wanna make sure I ask because I know one thing I wanna say is thank you for doing this because I know you're super busy and oh. and and making this all work out's just been super cool. Um, for people out there who find this world very interesting. What would you recommend start? I mean, if they're kind of early in their career and they're like, this is super cool. This is something I really want to look into. What would you recommend for them? Is it more an influence on getting that degree, going into psychology and, and studying this at a an academic level or more influence on the music itself? Where where does it lie there well, for early, I, early in the career? Yeah, I I think there, you know, there's there's obviously not necessarily any one path. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, I, I started by talking about Right. All, all the detours, you know, in in my own yep. journey. Yep. So, yep. Uh, you know, I I I think the message there is that journeys are not always linear, yep. um, uh, and and there's a lot of sometimes circling back, and in circling back, we're never quite at the same place. Uh, mm-hmm. There's things that we've learned, and and that kind of informs uh, more choices. But I would say, uh, you know, if if you're really interested in this idea of you know, thinking about sound from a strategic standpoint, um, there are a number of different entry levels. And I think um, it pays to have a little bit of of understanding um, uh, in in a variety of disciplines. And you can decide what's more interesting to you or not and and be able to to kind of carve your own path. So I think there's a part of it where um, music science and music psychology is is actually important. Uh, mm-hmm. That doesn't mean that you have to have a psychology degree, but you should certainly understand um, some things around the the science um, of music and and sound and its application. Uh, and there's so much literature out there. Um, it's easy if you know if you just. <laughs> If you just start Googling or go to Twitter and, um, uh-huh. you know, hashtag music science, yeah, uh, you know, yeah. there, there are quite a few uh, friends of mine in academia that use that hashtag and, uh, and I actually use it on occasion. And you'll find, you know, you'll find things that way. Um, you know, look for journal articles, uh, read, uh, you know, what you can there so that you understand that perspective. Uh, I think another path in is actually through strategy. Um, so in the world of advertising uh, and marketing, there are strategists, um, and part of the strategist's job is is to really uh, dive in and find insights, and that's moving beyond just 
you know, a surface view of the data. It's mm -hmm. kind of drilling down into um, what is this data really telling us? And what are the things that we're learning from this data that give us insights into consumers, into their behavior, and then start thinking about how sound might intersect with mm -hmm. those insights as, as part of communication. Um, you know, another path in is also through uh, research and testing. Mm -hmm. um, so there's more companies that are starting to pop up that are doing um, uh, explicit research in this area, which explicit is still quantitative, but it's a little bit more uh, survey-based um, or even uh, focus group-based. Then you have implicit research, which tends to come more on the, the neuroscience side. Uh, so there's more and more uh, companies that are starting to look for ways to test audio. Um, and, uh, you know, you may be drawn to that kind of uh, research um, and love music, and this might be an opportunity uh, for that. Or you might be, you know, a musician and a, and a composer, uh, and simply by understanding a little bit about um, music psychology and sound uh, psychology or, or psychophysics, um, you uh, might also be able to apply a little bit of that in thinking about your your compositions mm -hmm. um and i will say this uh for composers and i would say even for sound designers um you know composers that have composed for a while have really fine-tuned instincts mm -hmm. and a lot of the research um that we we see really uh in a, in a lot of ways kind of confirms where uh composers and designers go instinctively interesting and 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 you know those those instincts you know for instance let's you know kind of talk again about sound and taste yeah, yeah. so if i were to say you know hey i've got a brand it's a it's a candy brand it's it's really sweet um and so i i i need a piece of music that kind of is congruent with candy and that sweetness you know, most composers are probably going to think about something that's high pitched. Yeah. Um, you know, they may think of something that might even take them back to their childhood uh, a little bit. It's going to be very, uh, you know, in a, in a in a positive key. Might even be a little playful. And the research shows that those tend to be the sonic seasonings that uh, that kind of get this idea of sweetness across. If I were to say, this is a coffee brand, it's a really dark roast, um, you know, a, a very bitter coffee, most right, composers right. would think things in a lower register, they might go towards, you know, lower strings, cellos, bass. Um, they might put some, you know, a little bit of grit uh, into it um, and might might even move towards a minor modality. Mm -hmm. And the research has shown us those are the sonic seasonings that kind of relate to those taste profiles. And it's not really because composers have studied that right. as much as just the way we're all natural synesthetes. And so this idea of bitter tastes is easily translated into bitter sounds. Right. Um, you know, we might say, oh, that sounds sweet. Uh, and for most of us, even if we're not musicians, we could identify probably sweet sounds. Exactly. Um, yeah, yeah, because we're, we're all living in this world where there's advertising all around us. So, right. So those composers grew up in the same world that everyone else is growing up in. So so there's these associations. Just, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And and when we think about meaning, I mean, here's a whole other area that we, we didn't even touch on, which, you know, we talk a lot about music and emotions. Right. Um, and there's been a lot of research there. Uh, but I got to curious because, again, my psychology background and, and uh, you know, my, my tendency to kind of look th at things through more of a Jungian lens um, and beginning to look at archetypes, you know, these these symbols that that crop up in in mythology and stories that aren't bound to by history or, or culture, you know, and, and thinking about that sonically uh, and thinking, well, you know, if we think about emotions, the term happy Right. Happy could be something to a jester that might be really different to an outlaw. Yeah. Or yeah. to a caregiver or to a sage. Yeah. 
yeah. um, or to uh, 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 an explorer. Um, and so I wanted to see if maybe I could tease out through some research whether or not there were actually sonic archetypes, musical right. archetypes. Um, and we found that uh, in talking to composers about uh, you know the, the building blocks that they would use to communicate these symbols, um, we found in our research that they composers are kind of drawing from a similar well uh-huh. uh, with without necessarily talking to each other or being trained to do that, you know, other than perhaps we've drawn on these archetypes um, throughout history in the way we think about sound. Mm-hmm. And, and so what we found was that we could actually have an algorithm uh, listening to music and identifying these pieces of semiotics, making choices, and then people listening would actually be in some ways decoding yeah. these semiotics. And so if you start thinking about the implications of that, that we could actually change a narrative, and, and we've demonstrated this through the research too, that by simply changing the archetypal narrative of a piece of music mm-hmm. under a visual, we can change the entire storyline. Yeah. Simply by changing the music. You're seeing the exact same thing. Right. But the story is now interpreted differently because yeah. of what you're you're hearing. So again, we we could talk for hours. Uh, oh yeah, you know, yeah, and, yeah. And you know, don't <laughs> you know, you, you you talked earlier about thanking me for the for the opportunity, uh, yeah. you know, and cool. I thank you for the opportunity to just, you know, I love talking about, uh, you know, the power of sound, and and this is just another opportunity to do that, and so oh, hopefully, yeah. you know, your listeners will will hear something. Maybe they'll think about, uh, you know, something differently from a career standpoint, or, uh, you know, at, at the very least, I hope they walk away from this podcast uh, and, and this video walk out into the world and now their ears are tuned a little yeah. bit differently not just when they're listening to commercials but maybe when they're in a restaurant or mm-hmm. maybe in a healthcare setting or maybe in a park or maybe in a department store and uh, they'll be sensitized to to the sounds around them and be a little bit more aware of how it might be impacting their perception and behavior yeah I, I just I, I love that. And seriously, one thing I, I say at the end of these, and I think this one would just stand on its own is if you want to ever just do this again. I mean, I feel like you and I could just go for hours and hours and, and all this is we just started opening up new topics and we're like, wait, oh, yeah. wait, wait, because because it's just there's there's so much interesting uh, material to dig into. And I just I again, I just I do. I, I thank you for doing this. And um and I think this is going to stand as one of those episodes that people are going to love. And if, yeah, if you ever want to just uh, come back in six months, a year or whatnot, and talk <laughs> about how things have changed and how things have uh, have progressed or just go down a totally different rabbit hole, I am absolutely in. Well, you know you know where to find me. And, yeah. uh, and being at Pandora, because, uh, you know, I'm surrounded by incredibly smart, intelligent people. And, you know, I always love being the dumbest guy in the room. Uh, because that's, you know, that's the time when I'm challenged and I learn. Yep. And, you know, we're already kind of exploring some some new things around mer- uh, music and sound and personality yep. types. And as we get into voice, you know, that's something we didn't even really touch on. But, you know, what happens when we start thinking about the voice that we hear and the inflection and cultural distinctions behind that and, and the impact of even those choices um, on our perception of, of the brand and each other and the world and our receptiveness to messages. So, uh, yes, anytime, you know where to find me. So. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. And, and that's one thing I, I do want to let, uh, let people know best place to follow you would be Twitter, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. What's the handle one more time? Just so people it's, can. Uh, it's audio alchemist underscore. Don't forget Perfect. the underscore at the very, very end. So at audio alchemist underscore You'll find me and um, look for me there. Perfect, perfect. And big shout out to Pandora. Okay. Well, thanks a lot for the time being able to do this. I loved it.